All right, well, hello. My name is Dan Schreiber. I am the meteorologist and instructor for this course. I'm ecstatic that you decided to take this course, and I'm excited to uh, to be able to instruct. So this has always been a passion of mine, weather in general, meteorology in general. It's always been a passion of mine, and so I'm excited to share that wealth of knowledge with you. This first set of slides is a set of slides that I will give at just about any weather talk that I do in any course that I teach. It's somewhat lengthy, but it develops a good baseline understanding of the meteorological environment. It, it helps you understand the the foundation so that we can build upon it in further lectures and, and, and the, the lectures to come. So it is a, it's, it's a good amount of knowledge. You may have to watch it twice because I'm going to feed you a lot of information very, very quickly. But I, I strongly recommend that you find a good understanding of it um, before we move on in, in the course or in, in, in this discussion because everything I teach you from here on out is going to build upon this. So with that being said, I'll tell you a little bit about me. I've been practicing meteorology since 2012. I graduated uh, from Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University in Arizona in 2012, uh, and then I got my master's as well. I spent about six years, a little over six years, in the Air Force uh, as an Air Force meteorologist. I also, during that time, was stationed with the Army and, and worked with the Army on division staff. And then I also am a meteorological consultant with a business that I started called Small Town Weather. And you may be taking this class uh, in reference to... Uh, something you saw from from my small town weather uh, outreach that I do. So anyway, however you got here, I'm just excited to, to be here with you and I'm excited to share the knowledge and experience that I have in, in aviation meteorology uh, among uh, other different facets of meteorology with you. So hopefully you get a lot out of this class. So let's go ahead and begin with the, uh, the basic foundation of how weather works. The first thing that I want you to understand, and weather is actually a very, very easy concept. How weather exists is not a very complicated thing. It's actually very easy to understand. So literally in a matter of just a few slides in a few minutes, you're going to, it's uh, hopefully it's going to all come together for you. It's, it's not very, very difficult. And honestly, this is the way that I wish it was taught when I went to college, but I'm going to teach it to you here real quick. So to make things very, very simple, weather would not occur if two things didn't happen. The first thing is, is if there was no sunshine, the sun was not shining, there would be no weather. The second thing is, is if the earth was not curved, there would also be no weather. Uh, and the reason that it is, is because as the sun shines, it shines on the curved earth. You can see that in that first diagram there because it shines differently at every different place on earth and then all of our elements of this earth water trees plants dirt sand all of that every one of those absorbs and reflects heat differently the heating at any given point on the earth is going to be different at any given time so we have you know if on a hot sunny day you go and you, you touch your your car that's parked outside it's, it's gonna it's gonna be pretty hot it may even burn you then you go um you go into the grass or you maybe you go jump in a swimming pool and it's cooler it's much cooler well everything on earth is like that it's heated differently all at different times and at different degrees and in different capacities um, and so there's always going to be a temperature difference across the globe it, it's sunny during one time of the day it's uh, on one side of the globe well it's nighttime you know on the other side of the globe and there's always always gonna be a temperature difference there so the globe is being heated differently all the time in every place and so with that, it changes uh, the amount of pressure that's that's being applied on the surface of the Earth at all times. We look at this next slide here, you'll see there's a, a very simple formula. It's called the ideal gas law, but it's very, very simple to understand. We understand pressure. We see that on a weather map. It's high pressure today. It's low pressure today, right? So we understand pressure has a lot to do with weather. Then we also, I just talked about temperature on the other side of that equation there. The P is for pressure. The, the little p, it's actually a row. It's a Greek letter, but that, that's density. But let's just look at pressure right now. P is for pressure. T is for temperature. And you notice how they're on opposite sides of the equation. 
And that's because they are proportionate to each other. If temperature goes up, pressure goes up. If temperature goes down, pressure goes down. So what happens when you have two different temperatures in two different locations? Well, then you're going to have two different pressures in two different locations, which means one is going to be higher and the other is going to be lower. It's just the way it works. And so that is the fundamental like baseline, baseline, how weather begins to work. The difference between those two pressures is called the pressure gradient. Now the pressure gradient is uh, is a force, it's a force of nature, and the way that we experience the pressure gradient from day to day, because unless you're flying up in an airplane and your ears start popping or something like that, you kind of maybe realize there's a little difference in pressure. But on the horizontal field, is if you're just driving between Los Angeles and New York, you, you might not notice too much of a pressure difference, right? But there's probably several different high pressures and low pressures across the country at any given time. So the way we experience the pressure gradient in most cases is by the strength of the wind. Pressure gradient force drives the wind. Wind drives cooler temperatures, warmer temperatures. It pushes moisture in from the oceans and other bodies of water. Like I said, you get a cold front comes through and it gets cold behind the cold front because the wind is pushing cold air from the north. And so with this, just this simple temperature difference, creating a pressure difference, now all of a sudden we have wind and wind is what carries most of the weather. Usually when it's windy outside, man, it's kind of stormy outside. Or it's, whoa, man, it's breezy out there. You know, something's going on with the weather, right? Okay, cool. Now let's look into three dimensions. Let's look at the, the jars that we have down here in the bottom of the slide, the high pressure and the low pressure. We got to think three dimensions. High pressure, we call it high pressure, is because the air is sinking in the vertical. It's if you were to apply more pressure to the liquid in that jar and squeeze it, squeeze it together, that equals high pressure. So in high pressure, we have sinking air in the atmosphere. Where in low pressure, there's rising air. Now all of a sudden, all those molecules in the air can rise through that entire pitcher of water. So not only does air flow from high pressure to low pressure, just like a a basketball that's that's filled up a, a bike tire car tire that's filled up with air you put a hole in it it's going to deflate because there's higher pressure in the tire or the basketball than there is outside it'd be convenient if the air went in when you punched a hole in it but that's just not what happens because air always flows from high pressure to low pressure also in high pressure and low pressure the air has a vertical component to it so not only is it flowing horizontally but it is also going to be flowing vertically in high pressure the air is going to be sinking in low pressure the air is going to be rising now i mentioned that air always is going to flow from high pressure to low pressure but if you look at the map in the upper left corner the weather map up there you'll see that the air seems to be flowing around the pressure and that's definitely true especially as you move further and further aloft in the atmosphere and it's because of the Coriolis force so yes air is going to flow from high pressure to low pressure but it's not going to flow directly from high pressure to low pressure, especially as you move aloft. And that's because as 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 wind travels, especially in the, in the northern hemisphere, as, as wind travels, it's going to curve to the right because of the spin of the earth. That's how the Coriolis effect works. It's going to be opposite in the southern hemisphere. It'll move to the left. So as you look at weather maps, if you look at a weather map at the surface, a lot of times you'll see a, a little bit more of a direct flow from high pressure to low pressure. And you'll still see a little bit of curve, especially out over the oceans. But you'll see a little bit more direct flow from high pressure to low pressure. But as you move aloft, as you look at weather maps aloft, you'll start to see this, this curve flow around high pressure and low pressure. It's always going to be clockwise around high pressure and counterclockwise around low pressure. And then opposite of that, in the southern hemisphere. I talked about the three-dimensional flow a little bit in the previous slide, but here's just another graphic of how it works. Uh, like I said, low pressure, there's going to be rising air. There's going to be converging air in the low levels at the surface of, of a low pressure, and it's going to be rising. And that makes sense. If it's there's rising air, then there's creating a void or low pressure. A void is just another word for low pressure. A low pressure there at the surface because the air is rising. Just like that in high pressure, if there's high pressure at the surface, there's it, that's due to sinking air. Now all of a sudden the void is going to be aloft. The low pressure will be aloft, but the high pressure will be at the surface because of that sinking air and the wind will be flowing away from the high pressure forward the low pressure so hopefully that, that little graphic makes a little bit more sense the big thing you got to understand is is that if there is a low pressure at the surface there's going to be a high pressure aloft above it 
and vice versa. If there's a high pressure at the surface, there's going to be a low pressure aloft above it. And that's because you can't have two low pressures at the ends of the same pipe. If I have any plumbers out there, the air is always going to blow from one end to the other end of a, of a pipe or the water in your kitchen sink. And the water going to go, it's going to flow from one end to the other end. If it doesn't flow from one end to the other one, what do you say? Oh, I lost water pressure. Okay. Well, the atmosphere, the air is always going to blow from one place to another place. Otherwise, you don't have any pressure gradient. And so just like in the horizontal uh, plane, the air is always going to blow from high pressure to low pressure. It does the same in the vertical. If there's high pressure aloft, there's going to be low pressure at the surface. If there's low pressure aloft, there's going to be high pressure at the surface. Hopefully that makes sense. So there are four main types of fronts in weather. And I'm going to actually talk about five. <laughs> I know I said there's four, but there's actually kind of a fifth that I'm going to talk about here in a minute. But I'm going to walk through the main four, and we're talking about warm front, cold front, stationary front, and occluded front. The warm front first. The warm front generally blows from south to north. It may blow southwesterly to northeasterly, but we got to think where is the warm air going to come from for that warm front? The warm air is going to follow that warm front. It's generally going to be a little bit moist too. Warm, moist air. Well, where does warm, moist air come from in the northern hemisphere but say the equator right that's where the the warmest area is going to be you know closer lower latitudes is going to have the warmest moistest air especially in the in the eastern half of the united states where you've got the warm gulf of mexico uh and that's a good fuel for a warm front so warm air is always almost always going to come from the south if you live in the northern hemisphere and so the, you get this southerly air behind a warm front. It's generally going to be moist. You're generally going to see some clouds with it. It can be a little bit windy, especially overnight. But the biggest thing is the easiest way you can tell you had a warm front coming through is, is there's going to be all of a sudden you notice, wow, it's gotten a lot more hot and muggy. Um, and that's that's the presence of, of, a, of a warm front coming through. You couple that with the, with the south, the southerly winds, yeah, it's probably a warm front. Now, a cold front, again, it's going to be bring an air mass change. But where does cold air come from? But the north, right? The north, the northwest uh, is generally what we see in the northern hemisphere. Uh, we see cooler air coming, you know, all weather in the northern hemisphere, unless you're very near to the equator, like in the tropics, almost all weather is going to move from west to east. That's why it's always going to snow in the Rocky Mountains before it snows in the Great Plains. That's just the way it works. So we got to think it's going to have a westerly component to it, but the, the cold air comes from essentially the north, the Arctic. So the cold front comes through, it brings drier, colder air. There are always some exceptions, but the biggest thing is, is if in the, you're in the middle of winter time, you get this northwesterly wind, it gets colder, noticeably colder. Sometimes I've, I've seen it drop 20 and 30 degrees in a matter of an hour, noticeably colder. And then you notice that the air just isn't as moist anymore. It isn't as muggy anymore. That's because a cold front went through. Uh, some folks know it as a blue norther. Farmers and ranchers, you know, older time, oh, the blue norther, right? You know, it's it's because when you got this north wind and the the sky turned blue <laughs> and because it got drier and colder and and anyway so that's that's a cold front that's always going to come after the warm front so you'll notice right before a cold front comes through it's warm and muggy and all of a sudden this cold front comes through it gets windy the, the wind changes to the north and all of a sudden it's cooler you got to put on a jacket uh, a lot of times we can see storm development along a cold front as well. I'll get into a little bit of that later. But anyway, that's how you would know a cold front. Northwesterly winds, colder, drier. A uh, stationary front is generally we'll, we'll see it on the tail end of a, of a cold front, although we could see it on a tail end of a warm front as well. The stationary front is exactly what it sounds like. It's just a, a separation of two air masses. It's a front, but it's just not moving. It's stationary. All fronts are separation of air masses, meaning that there's got to be either cold and dry on one side, hot and moist on the other side. So something where you can tell a really a noticeable difference between what kind of air mass you're sitting in. Wow, it's hot and muggy. Okay, that's an air mass. Okay, it's called maritime tropical, but it's hot and muggy. That's what we'll call it. It's hot and muggy on one side, and it's, it's brisk, it's cold, it's dry. On the other side, there's a front. 
<laughs> that's separating those two things. There needs to be. The only thing, other thing that can separate two air masses is mountains. And so, you know, if we assume that there's no mountains there, especially in the Great Plains where there's really no mountains there, and you see this big air mass change, there's probably going to be a front there somewhere. A stationary front separates those two air masses. Generally, it's going to be some sort of cold air mass and some sort of hot air mass. But it just doesn't move much. There's generally some sort of cloud development, sometimes storm development along a stationary front because the atmosphere just wants to equalize itself. It doesn't like having this barrier between two air masses. It's trying to get to what you call thermodynamic equilibrium. But it's trying to... to make everything the same temperature. It's trying to make everything the same pressure and make everything the same temperature. We know that's not possible, but it's trying to, and that's when you would start to see storm development. It's generally um, not very windy weather unless you're, you're right inside a storm or something like that, but um, that's, a lot of times you'll, you'll notice a difference from one side of a, a stationary front to another side of a stationary front. An occluded front is a little bit uh, more difficult one. A lot, of, a lot of folks have a hard time trying to understand what an occluded front is, but it's, it's actually very simple. Uh, a cold cold front is going to move faster than a warm front and that's that's because a cold front has high pressure behind it the warm front generally has a little bit lower pressure behind it high pressure is applying more pressure to the back of the cold front and so it's going to move a little bit faster than that warm front is and especially going to catch up when it catches up to the warm front it come it cuts off the the food essentially to the low pressure system and then you get what you call this occluded front. Occluded front generally separates cold air from other cold air and so you'll see, definitely see an air mass change. Usually it's going to be cooler moisture air on one side and cooler drier air on the other side but this is where you're going to see your worst winter storms, your blizzards, your nor'easters, your um, freezing rain events will generally happen kind of right where the cold front, the warm front, and occluded front all come together. So just in cold weather, a lot of uh, snow or ice or something in there is going to be right along where that cold front is. Definitely going to be cloudy, probably thick clouds. And um, a lot of the, like I said, the worst winter storms are going to be somewhere right there um, near where the occluded front is. Now, the last front that I want to talk about, is this one isn't technically a front because in order to be a front, it generally has to be associated with a, a low pressure system and the jet stream. The jet stream cuts right through a low pressure system. When we're talking about winter winter low pressure system, it's fueled by the jet stream. I won't get into all the science behind that, but that's generally how you would identify, okay, this is not just a cold wave of air. It's it's really, a, a this is a cold front, or this is not just a warm push of air. It's a warm front. The dry line, on the other hand, does not have to be associated with a low pressure. It does not have to be associated with the jet stream. A lot of the times it is associated with a low pressure system though, but it doesn't have to be. The, the dry line is a lot like a uh, more or less a stationary front and it's almost always going to be through the central plains. You know, it's going to extend through Texas and then generally up into Oklahoma, Kansas. I've seen it all the way up to South Dakota before, and and I'll explain a little bit more of why why it forms there. Um, you will not usually see a dry line in the mountains. You'll not see it on the East Coast. It's just going to be in the central United States, and that's because it's separating the desert air from Arizona and New Mexico and the, the hot desert air from the warm, moist air in the Gulf of Mexico. They're both warm climate zones, but one is very dry and the other is very moist and there's got to be something that separates those two and that's where the dry line comes in the dry line uh, like i said is very common through the portions of west texas and there can be some bad storms that blow up along that dry line as the air and the atmosphere is trying to reach an equilibrium between the the warm and moist and the warm and dry like i said it just wants to even it all out but the only way you can figure out how to do that is to cause storms. And so a lot of times you can see severe weather right along the dry line. It, it's multiplied when there's a cold front that intersects with the dry line. Uh, now all of a sudden you not just have dry and moist air that are battling it out. Now you got cold, dry air and warm, moist air that are battling it out. Um, and there's, there's more players on the battlefield, if you will. So that's the last type of front that I wanted to talk about. It's a very, very important, especially if you live in the southern, uh, southern plains. All right, this next slide can get really, really complicated, and I don't want it to be, so I'm going to make it really, really short for you. As you know, you probably learned this in, in grade school, in the troposphere, as you go up in altitude, the temperature cools. 
that's the troposphere. Above the troposphere, we get a different part of the atmosphere. It's called the stratosphere. In the stratosphere, the temperature actually warms. Above that, we got the mesosphere, where the temperature cools again. And then above that, we got the thermosphere, which where the temperature warms again. So we got this cooling and then warming and then cooling and warming with height. Now, most weather that we deal with is going to happen almost exclusively in the troposphere. We'll see a little bit into the stratosphere and the, the lower ends of the stratosphere. But almost exclusively is going to happen in the troposphere. So we would expect the air to cool at a standard rate as we ascend with height throughout the troposphere. Um, and sure enough, it, it does. There's a standard rate, we call it the standard adiabatic lapse rate. Um, and there's a, it's a little bit different for dry air as it is for moisture, but we have this standard that it should be. The thing is, is that we all know weather, it, it's, the atmosphere is not perfect. It's not ideal. And so very rarely does it ever follow the exact standard. It's going to be a little bit to the left. It's going to be a little bit to the right. It's going to cool a little bit more. It's going to cool a little bit less. It might warm when it's supposed to be cooling and cool when it's supposed to be warming. That's what weather does. The standard is if everything were perfect. And but if everything were perfect, you know, there wouldn't be any weather. So so we have this standard that we kind of follow and it's called elapse rates. Um, but when we start to see air cooling a little bit faster than it should, it's called instability. When it's warming a little bit faster than it should or warming when it's supposed to be cooling, we call that a stable area is sta air stability. And so we deal with these areas of stability and instability within the troposphere all the time. For example, when we see a thunderstorm, the air is unstable. When we see fog, the air is stable. And all that weather is is in response to trying to make the atmosphere equal the standard. But we all know that it's never going to equal the standard because if it ever equaled the standard, there would be no weather. So it's just uh, kind of a catch-22. We'll go into more of that later. It's just important that you understand that nothing in the atmosphere ever really happens by standard or the way it's exactly supposed to happen but that's why weather happens. Now I'm going to keep saying it over and over again, but the atmosphere just wants to reach equilibrium and wants everything to be the same. The atmosphere does not like temperature differences. It does not like pressure differences. It wants everything to be the same. It wants equilibrium. But even if the world was completely flat and the sun shined on every piece of the world evenly, there would still be weather. It still wouldn't be perfect because there's different vegetation, there's water, there's mountains, there's forest, there's all sorts of different types of elements within the atmosphere that are going to heat and cool and radiate and reflect differently than each other. And so there's always going to be a pressure difference and a temperature difference and all that, and therefore there's always going to be weather. We need to understand the difference between those climate zones and and the weather that's in them for example we know it snows in the mountains in the winter time but the mountains is not weather the snow is the weather the mountains we just expect certain types of weather right the desert we know it's hot and dry in in, in the summertime in the desert and it's cooler and drier in the, in the desert in the winter time but the desert is not weather it's where dry weather occurs and that's the difference between the climate and the weather. So looking at the United States, we can see that about the western half of the United States is primarily uh, some sort of desert or steppe climate, semi-arid climate. Until you get to the, the coast, the California, Oregon, Washington coast, you start to see a little bit more Mediterranean, um, you know, or more humid climate of some sort. And that's because it's just right along the coastline. But then we hit the Sierra Nevada, the Cascade Mountains, and on the other side of the mountains, we see the desert. And we see the Rocky Mountains, and we see a more of a semi-arid climate. And then all of a sudden we get right along the Central Plains, and we get now a more humid climate several different types as we go north because it's just going to get cooler as we go north but it's all going to be more humid climate if if we notice where is tornado alley on this picture but right there in the central united states where these climate zones all come together again the weather the, the weather is just a response to the atmosphere trying to equalize itself it doesn't like the fact that it's got all these climate zones in the united states it doesn't like it and wants to equalize it. But the only way you can even attempt to equalize it is by causing weather. And 
try to manipulate a, a climate zone change, which is very, very hard to do because in order to really manipulate a climate zone change, um, you'd have to remove the mountains and the forest and, and all of that. You know, the Rocky Mountains, you can't just pick those up with a bulldozer and move them. So it's always going to be mountainous climate in the mountains. It's going to be arid on the other side of the mountains. It's always going to be like that. But the atmosphere wants to at least try to equalize it as best as it can. That's why weather exists. So the big question is, now that we kind of have an understanding of the, the science behind the way weather works, all weather is, I'm going to keep saying it, all weather is, is the atmosphere trying to equalize everything. That's all it is. Weather is just a response to the atmosphere trying to become equal. So now that we understand that, how do meteorologists work? How do the people who study the weather, how, how do we do our jobs, right? Because we know the atmosphere is never going to completely neutralize itself. There's always going to be a difference somewhere. How do we conduct our business? How, how do we figure out what's going to happen next? Well, it's, it's a great question. And the thing is, is that meteorology is, is a lot like going to the doctor, too. It's like doctors and meteorologists should, should be like best friends. They call a doctor's office a practice. I'm a practicing dentist. I'm a practicing surgeon, I, whatever, you know, I don't know much about the medical field, but you know, I, they, we call it a doctor's practice. Well, meteorologists, we practice a lot, okay, because it's not an exact science. Uh, we don't always, in fact, we almost never know the right answer until it happens, just like a doctor doesn't really know what's really wrong with you unless he goes in and does surgery and, you know, pulls the thing out and, oh yeah, that's cancer, you know, but then again, he doesn't even know if the, the treatment's going to be uh, as effective, okay, so meteorologists work a lot the same way, right? We, we kind of have an idea of what's going on, but we don't ever really know for sure if the weather that we're saying is going to happen is going to happen or it's going to happen the way we think it's going to happen we have to do a lot of reacting at the last minute right and we learn from that and that's why we call it a practice but nonetheless we've all made the joke oh 20 percent chance of rain 30 percent chance of rain what does that mean right some folks will say man it's gonna rain other folks will say oh they always say that you know right it's not gonna mean anything right so i don't know which one you are but it is a physical science, right? We take A plus B plus C plus D, all these factors, we kind of jumble them all together and say, hmm, I have high confidence that it's going to rain today. I'm going to say 80% chance, right? Or I have low confidence that it's going to rain today. I'm going to say 10%, 20% chance, something like that, right? And the thing is, is, as meteorologists, we have to try to understand how you and the general public are going to understand the way that we are projecting it. In other words, I can't stand seeing 30% chance of rain on the Weather Channel. It, it doesn't mean really much to me. I don't know whether I should take it as, well, it's going to rain somewhere in the area. It, it may or may not rain. I, should I flip a coin? Uh, I don't know. I, I mean, for me, it, it doesn't do me a whole lot of good. But meteorologists are still trying to perfect how we deliver things. What I tend to do, instead of th saying 30% 30, 30 chance of rain, I'll say rain showers in the area. Okay. That's just another way of saying it, but at the end of the day, it, there's probably going to be some, some rain showers somewhere within you know the nearby area. There might be a 30% chance it don't hit you, but it's going to be somewhere in the area, um, and that might be a better way to explain it. But we're still trying to figure out, as meteorologists, we're still trying to figure out the best way to portray the forecast. The other thing we got to take into mind is uh, sociology, right? So what is going to be the impact? This is going to be a really, really bad storm. We want to let you know that it's going to be a bad storm, and we'd rather you prepare for it and it not happen than and not prefer, prepare for it, and it does happen, right? So, you know, winter storms and stuff like that, you'll see a lot of that on the on the Weather Channel and a lot of these different weather apps. So, oh, you know, Stormzilla, you know, it's going to take over the world, right? right? It's all blown out of proportion. But at the end of the day, we know it's going to be bad, and so it's okay to hype it up maybe a little bit, not too much, but hype it up just enough to where, okay, <laughs> You know, the, the general public has got the point, right? It, it's going to be bad, right? Where if we didn't emphasize it enough, then you might not get the point and you might continue on with your normal daily business and it could be dangerous. So we're trying to figure out 
not only the way you're going to take it when we say it, but then what's the impact of it going to be, right? I mean, we see it all the time here in Texas when every time there's a hurricane in the Gulf of Mexico, you know, or even a chance for there to be a hurricane in the Gulf of Mexico, and somebody opens their mouth a little too wide, that you can't find gasoline at any of the gas stations. It just sells out. That's usually somebody hyping it up a little too much. Uh, but then again, if we don't tell you about the hurricane in the Gulf of Mexico, then nobody's going to prepare. So it's where is that happy medium going to be? And that's what meteorologists are still trying to figure out. Um, and it's not a perfect science, but we're, we're trying to figure it out. One of the tools that meteorologists use uh, is satellite. Uh, we have a lot of tools. I'm going to walk through them, but satellite is probably the best tool that we have. We can use different types of satellite. Invisible satellite is essentially just what we would see if we went up into a into the space station. You know, we're up in the space and looked back down at the Earth. It works during the the daytime. It doesn't work at nighttime because well, you can't see at nighttime, right? So that's visible satellite. Infrared satellite actually sees day and night because instead of looking at visual light out of the visual spectrum, it looks through the infrared spectrum. It's heat seeking essentially. It looks like looks at the temperature of the earth remember how i said the temperature of the earth is never the same in, in any two places R really i mean it's, it's always going to be the ocean's always going to be a different temperature than the land and the clouds are always going to be a different temperature than both of those because the clouds are generally above both the ocean and the land and therefore they're going to be a little bit different temperature right so it's a good tool to look at the clouds day or night because what it's actually looking at is the temperature of the cloud we'll see it on the satellite as as a cloud but it, really, it's just a temperature reflection of the cloud that we're looking at. Water vapor looks at the amount of moisture, uh, and that's also day or night. It'll look at the amount of moisture in the atmosphere, uh, generally in the mid and upper levels. It uses an infrared spectrum to look at it, but it, it brings out the moisture a little bit more than it brings out the, the temperature, per se. Radar is a different tool that we use. Radar has a very short distance that it looks at. It's usually about 100 to 200 miles. That's about the range that it has, but it looks at precipitation in the atmosphere. Essentially, the, the brighter the, the color on reflectivity product, the heavier the rainfall. That's not always true, but that's basic understanding of it, and that's because the radar sends out a radio wave. The radio wave bounces off the, the precipitation, and it comes back to the radar, and the radar says, oh, based on the return, this is heavy rain, or this is a snowflake, or this is a hailstone. And so that's how radar works. It also measures the how fast the particulates and the the, the hydrometers, the, the precipitation, how fast it's moving, the storms are moving, um, and that'll help us identify tornadoes and you know bad thunderstorms. So another huge product that we use. It can be used day or night. Generally, it's it's the most useful uh, when it's when it's raining somewhere in the area. If it's not raining, it, it doesn't really give us a whole lot of information. Airport weather observations. This is crucial and i have a class on this is maybe actually the class that you're taking when you're when you're watching this and listening to this but airport weather observations are crucial because they give meteorologists an understanding of points all over the united states all over the world exactly what the weather is at that specific airport and so we can track cold fronts and warm fronts really really well we can track fog we can track wind speeds blizzard conditions we can track all that nothing's better than having you know every couple of miles you know another weather station that just kind of gives us an idea of what the pressure is what the temperature is all of that i mean it's just amazing we can look at satellite but that doesn't tell us exactly what's going on at the surface and what people would be experiencing we can kind of get an idea maybe but you know same thing with radar oh it's raining there but how much rain is falling uh, we kind of have an idea but we don't really know unless we got something at the surface that's planted there that can tell us exactly what's going on at that point a lot of airport weather observations at and larger airports at commercial airports they are disseminated by weather observers not only do i have a machine there that can tell me kind of what's going on but i've actually got a pair of eyeballs balls as well which is even better than the machine to make sure that the right information is getting disseminated super super useful weather balloons are another important uh, piece of information that meteorologists use in fact i took a whole semester in college um, and just how to decode and encode these weather balloons 
I'm not going to go into any real detail on, on in it other than they're really useful to give us a three-dimensional picture of what the atmosphere looks at at a given point. They're all over the United States. They're actually all over the world. There's quite a few in the United States. They are usually launched twice daily, once in the morning, once in the afternoon, at least in the United States. That's how it works out. Other parts of the world, it'll be in different times, but it's usually about zero Zulu, zero UTC time, um, and 12 uh, UTC time. It just works out to morning and evening, generally in the United States. But more or less, it gives us a three-dimensional picture of what the atmosphere looks like. Super, super useful for weather forecasting. Another tool that meteorologists use are weather forecast models. Weather forecast models are used to predict the future. We can look at satellite radar, weather balloons, all of that it's a snapshot of what's currently going on. But weather forecast models are a good prediction of what will happen in the future. We use all of these, all of, all, not just models, but everything at our disposal, meteorologists will use to forecast the weather. It's good to see what's currently going on, what the current state of the atmosphere is. That's what we use the radar and the satellite and the weather balloons and all that for. But to get a good idea of what will happen in the future, it's good to have some guidance uh, for, for what's going to happen in the future. For example, on the left-hand side here, the blue uh, gridded tabular data that, that's showing us all sorts of it, what's the sky condition going to be, what's the temperature is going to be. We can look at there and say, oh, the high temperature for today uh, is 95 degrees. You know, that's what this one model is saying. Uh, we look at spaghetti models that are down there in the bottom. You can see all those, uh, the yellow and green lines, and they're kind of all jumbled up. And then the, the brighter of the of all of them is the average, right? So we can get a, a level of certainty from all the different models. And, and we can see, you know, how confident can we be in our forecast? So there's a lot of these out there. I'm not going to get all wrapped up in them and explain all them right now or anything like that, because that would take a long time. But the big thing is, is we're, we're not only going to look at what's currently going on in the atmosphere, but we're going to look at these computer-based guidance models to show us, okay, based on everything that's going on right now, this is going to be the most likely event going to happen in the future. And, uh, and we can move forward with that with some, some level of confidence. Okay, this may be the most important slide we're going to see in this entire deck of slides. I hope you're going to learn something on every slide, but if you don't learn anything else, this one is the most important, okay? There are a lot of weather sources out there. There's websites everywhere. There's apps for your smartphone everywhere. There's all of that, and they're all halfway good. If you're having a barbecue at your house, I, I really don't care which one you look at, but... If you are in a position of authority, if you are a city manager, an emergency manager, an airport manager, if you're you got something where there's you run a business and there's a lot of liability, uh, you know, you're making a decision based on weather that's going to have big impacts to where there's going to be either um, damage to property, um, hazardous to life, that sort of stuff, and weather is going to dictate that. Look at these authoritative weather sources, okay? The Weather Channel is great. It's fine if you want to watch the Weather Channel. If it's fine if you want to put that in the break room and, and all that. They like to hype stuff up a lot. They like to have shows where they scare people and get their ratings up, okay? It's cool. I mean, that's cool stuff. But when I'm talking about the protection of life and property, the authoritative weather source is, is the only one you can really legally go with and, and have a leg to stand on. And that is the National Weather Service, National Oceanic and uh, Atmospheric Administration. It, fall, it all falls under the Department of Commerce right now um, of the United States government. Okay, They're the ones who issue the tornado warnings and the hurricane warnings and the blizzard warnings and all of that sort of stuff. That all comes from the National Weather Service. Now, it may be rebroadcasted on the local news channel or the weather channel or weather bug or AccuWeather or whatever, it may be rebroadcasted on there, but the source is the National Weather Service. Um, if you're not within the United States, if, if you're in Mexico, you're in Canada, you're, you're somewhere else, um, there's, there's generally a, a government meteorological source. Okay, Your, your federal government meteorological office uh, is going to be your authoritative weather source. And the important thing is, at least within the United States, is that if, if it ever happens that, that weather really ruins somebody's day, you have a mass casualty incident because of weather, you know, hazardous, 
severe weather, right? There's a, a damage, you know, millions and billions of dollars worth of damage and all of that. And, and you have to go back and do an investigation about what happened with the weather. You know, what was the weather forecast? What was, when did that tornado uh, warning first get issued? You know, what, where, where are all the reports of everything that happened? It's all found on the National Weather Service. You can't do that on a lot of these other websites, but you can do it through the National Weather Service because they have to archive that sort of stuff. And so that's why I always tell folks, use these authoritative weather sources. I really, I mean, I, that's the only source I really look at. I mean, weather.com every once in a while because that's the weather channel. I don't even look at AccuWeather, WeatherBug. No, I don't even have a smartphone, so I don't have any of those apps. But National Weather Service, and they do have an app as well, they're the ones that I look at every single day to you know to see to see what our federal partners are doing um and like i said they're ultimately going to be the ones pressing the, the buttons for the tornado warnings and hurricane warnings and all of that now the national weather service puts out all sorts of different types of forecasts it sometimes requires somebody to sit there all day and sift through all of the stuff that they put out for a certain location especially when the weather's getting bad it's hard to keep track of all of it and i even teach a course just for emergency managers on how to handle the national weather service and the amount of information that they put out and what's a need to know and what's not so important and and all of that but Nonetheless, they have a ton of information. They have all the information you need to know. You just need to know how to read it and know where to find it. But anyway, I'll try to break it down here really quick for some of the, the important things that they've got. You'll see a weather outlook. They'll push hazardous weather outlook, for example. It's just a forecast. That's all it is. If it's a hazardous weather outlook, it's a forecast for hazardous weather. It's generally not imminent. It's it's generally just like, hey, just say no, you know, be careful. It's going to be hot. Something like that, right? It could be for a day. It could be for a season. It could be, shoot, it could be for a year. They have like climatological outlooks that are for for a year, you know, even longer than that sometimes. So all it is is a, a forecast and they'll just, a lot of times they'll just call it an outlook. They have advisories. Advisories uh, are kind of like a step up from an outlook. Um, they generally talk about hazardous nuisance weather. For example, frost advisories. Okay, it, it's probably really not going to affect too many people unless you're a farmer or something like that. Or you may need a couple extra minutes in the morning to scrape the, the frost, the ice off of your windshield or something like that. It's probably not going to kill anybody. It's not going to cause really any widespread damage. Like I said, maybe unless you're a farmer or something like that. Uh, you know, heat, there's heat advisories, wind chill advisories, wind advisories. So there's, but they're just not, not very severe. They're just, hey, it's not normal it may be a nuisance but it's probably not going to hurt or kill anybody or cause any extensive amount of damage so uh, that's the first kind of line of defense that you'll see there as this advisory if you see an advisory yeah pay attention to it but it's not as important as some of these other ones that we're going to come come up with we'll see weather statements those are much like advisories. A lot of times you're a downgrade from a weather warning. Uh, usually they include hazardous weather phenomena. For example, here we got a rip current statement. Honestly, I don't know why they call it a statement. They could just call it an advisory. Uh, I see this a lot with like uh, severe weather statements um, and, and all of that. Where it's like, well, you could just call it an advisory or maybe just keep it as a warning. Um, it, it could cause some life threats or property threats. Rev currents kill people, okay? So it's just it's good for you to know, but it may not affect everybody. Uh, so anyway, it's out there. It's much like an advisory. It's worth reading. It may be for the future. It may be for right now, but take a look at it. Statement. And then we have what we call a weather watch. This and a weather warning get confused a lot from folks. A watch indicates potential for dangerous weather. It generally is a precursor to weather warnings, meaning that sometimes before a warning you'll see a watch. But generally, if there's going to be a widespread severe weather, you're going to see a watch, a weather watch, before you see a weather warning. So watch means that there's potential. It does not necessarily mean that the bad weather is occurring yet. It just means that the atmosphere is prime to produce bad weather. We're going to watch for it. That's what it means. Weather watch. 
A weather warning, on the other hand, is it's happening now. Uh, it's imminent or it's occurring. It's likely to cause damage to property or people. It could kill you. Uh, it could hurt you. It's dangerous. You need to take cover now. Do something about it now. Tornado warning. Take cover now. Severe thunderstorm warning. Take cover now. So hurricane warnings and all of that, hurricane force winds, and so it's going to create a lot of damage. It could be deadly. That is a warning. It is imminent or it's already occurring. Hopefully we get it while it's imminent, but sometimes we don't. Sometimes the way we find out it's happening is it's already happening. Okay, and and it's just, we gotta move with it, and we call it a weather warning. And so, yeah, if you see a warning, it's important, pay attention to it, do something about it right now. All right, so, a lot of information there. If you need to review that information, just go ahead and, and, and move on back and, and go through it again. If you have any questions, you can always let me know. And I'll, I'll be happy to elaborate a little bit more. It's a, it, like I said, it's a ton of information. A lot of that stuff is, I, I think I was already two years through college before I learned that level of of, of stuff. Um, so it's a lot of information that I wanted to, to give you. But I didn't want to take two years of your life to give it to you. So, so there it is, right? here's maybe where we'll kind of solidify some things it's just quiz see where you're at we'll see we'll see how we do here right in the northern hemisphere what direction is a cold front usually bringing air from okay we're talking about northern hemisphere that's where you and i and most of us are living if you're watching this although hey you never know World Wide web right but in the northern hemisphere what direction does a cold front usually bring air from well, we think cold air. Cold air is from what direction in the northern hemisphere? It's from the north. Okay, so we know north is going to be in part of our answer. Okay, now what direction do storms usually move from? Do they do they move from the north to the south? Do they move from the east to the west? No, okay, usually they're going to move from the west to the east, okay? Usually, like I said, it's going to snow in the Rocky Mountains before it snows in the Midwest, okay? So we know north is already part of this answer. The other thing is, is it's moving. Cold fronts are going to move from west to east, and so it probably can have more of a northwesterly component. So which one of these answers most likely is going to be the right one? West to north? Yeah, that sounds bright. East to south? No, uh, cold front doesn't move from the east to the south. Southeast to southwest. No, that'd be more of a warm front because the warm air comes from the south. Um, and then east to west, that's like 180 different degrees. So not not super concerned about that one right now. Let's see what our right answer is. Uh, right answer, yeah, right west to north. Okay, northwestern more or less. <laughs> And um, you can see the reasoning there, right? So cold air is generally found from the north. However, since low pressure systems generally move from west to east, cold fronts typically come from west to north, depending on the geography. Southerly winds are more character characteristic of warm fronts as warmer air is found to the south. Okay. Makes sense? All right. What air mass typically follows a warm front? Okay. We already can knock two of these answers off, right? Warm front is not cool air. Okay, so cool and dry, that's out. Cool and moist, that's out, right? So we know it's either C or D. Now, remember what I said about warm front. Uh, warm fronts, especially in the eastern half of the United States, generally bring warm air from the Gulf of Mexico. The Gulf of Mexico is dry or is it moist? Right? It's, it's muggy. It's warm, muggy swamp air. Okay, so here I think D is going to be uh, our best answer for the what air mass is typically follows a warm front. Yeah, and sure enough, there it is. Cool and dry air mass is generally following a cold front. Cool and moist air mass is generally an occluded front or maybe a stationary front. And a warm and dry air mass is going to be uh, behind a, a dry line. What weather instrument is best for viewing clouds at nighttime? Okay, this takes us back to the weather instruments that we use, okay? Radar, can we use radar at nighttime? Yes, absolutely. What does radar look at though? Radar looks at precipitation, not necessarily clouds, okay? You can have an overcast sky, completely clouded up, but if it's not raining, the radar is not really gonna notice it, okay? So radar is out. An anemometer. An anemometer is a wind instrument. It's what we use to measure wind speed and wind direction. Infrared satellite. Okay, satellite can be used 
depending on which mode we're looking at from the satellite, right? A visible satellite can't be used at nighttime because it's just like using your two eyes to, to look at something at nighttime. You're not going to see it very well, okay? But an infrared satellite is heat-seeking, so it essentially looks at the temperature of things, right? Everything emits some sort of temperature day or night, so that's why infrared satellite can look at clouds at nighttime. So I think that's the right answer. Night vision goggles, uh, you can sometimes. It depends what the illumination is uh, of the moonlight, but in complete darkness, night vision goggles still aren't going to work. Um, so we're going to have to go with infrared satellite here for our best answer. And sure enough, that's the, the correct answer. All right, which weather alert means imminent or occurring? A weather watch, a weather warning, a weather advisory, or a weather outlook? Okay, a weather watch. Remember, we're just watching for severe weather. It doesn't necessarily mean it's occurring. It just means that it has the potential for occurring, okay? So that's, that's not a watch. Watch is always accompanied with the word potential. Okay, weather warning. Yeah, okay, that's the right answer. But I'm going to go over these other two, okay? Weather advisory, okay? Weather advisory, it could mean that it's imminent occurring. It could mean it, it may occur here in a little while. But it's it's more nuisance weather okay it's it's it, like i said it could mean it's happening now it could mean it's happening later weather outlook that's just a forecast could be happening now could be happening later again weather warning if you hear that warning it is imminent or it's occurring if you hear watch that just means hey heads up we're going to be watching for this weather makes sense okay weather warning is going to be the correct answer there remember just tornado warning it's imminent or it's occurring take cover now Lastly, what direction does air flow around low pressure in the northern hemisphere? Okay, this one, this one was a tough one in college for me, right? It took me a little while to figure this one out. Because we use these terms called anticyclonic and cyclonic and all of this, and, and that's just confusing. Let's just talk in the way that the clock spins, okay? Air flows around high pressure in a clockwise manner and low pressure in a, a counterclockwise manner. The easiest way for me to remember this was if you look at a hurricane and you see a hurricane, uh, a hurricane is just a low pressure system. It's a little bit different than like a winter storm low pressure system, but it's a low pressure system nonetheless. In hurricanes, you think of the cyclone, which way it, which way it's turning. It's if you've ever watched a hurricane long enough on the TV or something, you'll know it's going to be turning in a counterclockwise position. Okay, hurricanes, a low pressure system, just like any other low pressure system in the northern hemisphere, it's going to turn counterclockwise. Okay. Yeah, high pressure is going to be clockwise. Yeah, north to south, not necessarily. Sometimes low pressure does move from north to south, and sometimes it moves from south to north, but that's not really a direction of flow around the low pressure. It just might be the way that the low pressure is moving, but it doesn't mean necessarily the airflow around it. Uh, the correct answer here is cyclonic, or uh, another word for that is counterclockwise. And here you go. Here's your map. I had this earlier in the slide deck. Uh, you can see the air flowing counterclockwise around the low pressure, clockwise around the high pressure. Okay, well, that about sums it up. I hope you learned something here. If you need to rewind, watch it again. If you need to email me, um, send me a question, whatever. I'd be happy to answer any of your questions or elaborate on things maybe a little bit different to help you out. Um, this is a lot of information, but I hope you enjoy this course. Uh, there's a lot more to come depending on which course you're taking, but it's all going to build upon this sort of information right here. So I strongly suggest you get a good grip of what's going on in these slides here, and there's only like 35 of them or so. It's not that many slides, but it's a ton of information. Get a good grip on it so that as you progress through your whatever, which whichever course you're taking, um, that that you know how to build upon this one. It's going to be a little bit more difficult in the, in the, in the following uh, course slide shows um, if you don't understand this one, you know, at least at least a good bit. And I'll reiterate it as we as we come up with it. But this is going to be your foundational understanding of how weather works. Again, it's been great uh, hanging with you. Thank you so much for your support and listening to me talk for the past hour. Like I said, I'm here for you. I want you to learn this stuff. Um, and I'm excited for, for you as, as we progress uh, further down this path. Thanks again.